Okay. Uh, the next three House Joint Resolutions 66, 88, and House Joint Resolutions 127 are pretty much similar uh, in content. Uh, and so um, we've got uh, Representative Maggard, uh, Representative Curtis, and Representative Kelsey. Uh, if the three of you or two of you or either one of you wanted to make any comments uh, on them at this time, have an opportunity. Um, and it, if not, we can move on to the, to the next one. Okay. Or any comments on any of the three uh, HJRs. Okay. Representative Curtis. Are you asking us now if we want to comment on our? Yes, if you want to yeah, comment we, on we your want to comment. Oh, I don't think we need to hear from all three of us separately. Uh, it doesn't matter if one wants to speak or uh, we can all three set up there in a the panel. It don't matter to me how we go about it, but I think we certainly want to speak. Well, that's why I was trying to put you three together. So um, you know. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to go through it three times. Right. I think Representative Maggot seems like she's yielding to you, Representative Curtis, and uh, I don't see Representative Kelsey. If it's all right with you, Mr. Chairman, we'll go up here and say it now. We won't be fighting for a microphone. We'll both have one apiece, and we'll oh. be able to look you right in the eyeball. You got it. All right. While they're moving to the microphone, uh, we've got one other House Joint Resolution by Representative Camper. After that, uh, we're going to allow 30 minutes uh, for public comment uh, on the House Joint Resolution. We're going to have the proponents uh, to uh, go first, uh, then we're going to have the AG's office and legal services at that time, and then we'll move to the opponents of the legislation. And then after that, we'll start with each one of the House bills. Uh, Representative Curtis, Representative Maggie, you want me to send the Sergeant Arms after Representative Kelsey, or I believe you are up to the task. <laughs> well, he was our legal counsel, but we can, we can draft some more, I think, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. You're recognized. All right. I'll, I'll let Representative Maggard start out. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All um, these resolutions do, it just makes the state constitution neutral on the subject of abortion, and it puts it back into the legislature's hands to decide what the regulations are about abortion in the state of Tennessee, and that is all it does. And we also have someone here today. Um, at the appropriate time. Uh, we have Mr. Paul Litton here. He is a constitutional attorney.
to answer questions about the constitutional aspects of this. Okay. And if y'all want to go into the public portion of that and he's part of that, we can. I mean, you know, it's your time there, Representative Curtis. Yeah, if we could bring him up, uh, since we'll let him uh, give the constitutional part of this, but I don't have to explain to any of you sitting in front of me that I'm not an attorney. There might be some folks behind me that don't know who I am, but I know that everyone sitting here knows I'm not an attorney. You're a courthouse attorney. Well, I, I, I think for, I was in the Marine Corps, I was what you might call a, a sea lawyer, and that really didn't have a degree. We just sort of had opinions. Uh, <laughs> but uh, is my understanding of all this uh, is listen to Mr. Fincher's uh, piece of legislation, some of the questions were posed, but the, the, the resolutions that Representative Maggard and I have are basically word for word with what 127 is. And the intention is just to remove any guarantees from our, our Constitution, just to wipe the slate clean. Uh, our Supreme Court has, has read and, and determined that there are some guarantees in there that I don't know if our forefathers contemplated or not. But the bottom line is that no matter how our Constitution reads, the U.S. Constitution is going to trump whatever our Constitution says anyway. The case that uh, was brought up about the lady with breast cancer, is my understanding that, that the Supreme Court ruling takes care of that. That, that lady would have the issue, her, her life's at stake and her health's at stake. She's got that guarantee under the U.S. Constitution. There's nothing this legislature or any other legislature could do to infringe upon that person's rights because of what the U.S. Uh, Constitution guarantees. And with that, I'll hush and let our, uh, our attorney speak as to the Constitution, constitutional changes we're seeking to change with these uh, resolutions. Okay. Now, I want to make clear, uh, is he uh, part of the public, uh, I guess, portion for the proponents? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So we're going to start the timer also then. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before your committee today and offer testimony in favor of House Joint Resolution 66, 88, and 127, and for the sake of saving time, also in opposition to House Joint Resolution 61. Before getting into my testimony, I think because of the complexity of the legal and constitutional issues, it would be a good idea for the committee to have a sense of what my qualifications are. In this area. I've been a practicing attorney for 35 years. I've represented parties, interveners, and friends of the court in the United States Supreme Court, the majority of the federal courts of appeals, and almost half of the state reviewing courts of the United States. These cases covered a broad spectrum of state and federal constitutional issues, including uh, landmark decisions of the Supreme Court in the area of abortion, assisted suicide, the right to refuse unwanted medical treatments, and other areas. In the Sunquist uh, decision, which is the subject of all these resolutions today, I represented uh, 32 members of this legislature before the Tennessee Supreme Court in support of the defendants. In addition to my litigation work, I've testified in legislative committees in 10 different uh, states, including a subcommittee of this committee in April of 2002, and I've been consulted on state legislation as well as state constitutional amendments in most of the states. I published a dozen law review articles on a variety of subjects, including state and federal constitutional law. And just last August, I published a, the first comprehensive analysis of abortion as a right under state constitutions entitled Abortion Under, Feder I'm sorry, abortion under State Constitutions, Carolina Academic Press.
With that background in mind, I'd like to turn to my testimony on these resolutions. HJR 66, 88, and 127, as has already been stated, are intended to overturn the Tennessee Supreme Court's decision in Planned Parenthood of Middle Tennessee versus Sunquist and return to the people their rightful authority acting through their elected representatives and senators to regulate the practice of abortion. all within federal constitutional limits. Sunquist, in my judgment, was a seriously flawed decision. It represented an unwarranted expansion of the Tennessee Constitution to a subject which neither the drafters nor the ratifiers ever contemplated. In Sunquist, a majority of the Tennessee Supreme Court held that the state constitution confers a fundamental right to abortion, a right that is even broader than the one recognized in Roe versus Wade as modified by Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Because of the nature of the right recognized in Sunquist, that is, it's a fundamental right, any regulation of abortion must meet the strict scrutiny standard of judicial review. Under this standard, and this is quoting from the opinion, it is the state's burden to show that the regulation is justified by a compelling state interest and narrowly, uh, narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Under this standard, a broad range of regulatory measures that would pass muster and in some instances have where they've been challenged under the federal constitution would not meet the standard of review adopted in Sunquist, including laws requiring physicians to provide their patients with detailed informed consent and laws imposing short waiting periods, both of which were struck down in Sunquist, as well as laws prohibiting partial birth abortion and laws regulating clinics that perform first trimester abortions. There's a reference in my uh, written testimony to the Court of Appeals decision that deals with that. In light of the Tennessee Supreme Court's decision in Sunquist, at least some provisions of House Bills 436, 445, and 2204 would likely be held unconstitutional, as well as the attempt in HB 436 to subject all physicians' offices where abortions are performed to the requirements applicable to outpatient surgical treatment centers. Although the state Supreme Court has not yet been asked to review the constitutionality of your laws mandating parental consent and prohibiting public funding of abortion, those laws are also at risk under the standard of review adopted in Sunquist. It should be noted, and this is very important, that unlike the state Supreme Court's decision in Sunquist, every other state reviewing court that has considered the validity of an informed consent statute under a state constitution has upheld the statute. The Supreme Courts of Florida, Indiana, Mississippi, and Missouri, along with the Michigan and Ohio Courts of Appeals, have all rejected state constitutional challenges to their informed consent statutes. These challenges were rejected in these states, even though in three of these states there is a specific uh, the, the courts have recognized a right to abortion in those states. That would be uh, Florida, uh, Mississippi, and Ohio. The decision in Sunquist is an anomaly and an outlier. Since the Supreme Court decided Planned Parenthood versus Casey almost 17 years ago, no final decision of any state or federal court other than this decision in Sunquist has struck down an informed consent statute on either state or federal constitutional grounds. In addition to the state challenges I've already mentioned, federal challenges to statutes mandating informed consent and short waiting periods have been rejected in Indiana, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Dakota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, Utah, and Wisconsin. A decision of a state Supreme Court that finds no support in the jurisprudence of the United States Supreme Court the lower federal courts or any other state court in the country should give one pause. In his eloquent and scholarly dissent, Justice Barker commented on the extreme nature of the majority's decision in Sunquist. Plainly stated, he said, the effect of the court's holding today is to remove from the people all power 
except by constitutional amendment to enact reasonable regulations of abortion. Rather than leaving policy decisions regarding reasonable regulation to the General Assembly, this Court has converted itself into a roving constitutional convention, which sees itself free to strike down the duly enacted laws of the legislature for no other reason than it feels they are burdensome and unwise. In so doing, this Court has been unable to convincingly point to any textual or historical basis for its decision, and it's holding that our Constitution provides greater protection for the judicially created right of privacy than the federal Constitution is contrary to nearly 200 years of legal precedent. By virtue of its decision, he said, the Court has elevated one extreme of this debate to a constitutional level and has made any meaningful compromise on this issue all but impossible. The majority opinion, he concluded, effectively removes from the General Assembly any power to reach a reasonable compromise that considers all of the important interests involved. Now, given the unwarranted expansion of abortion rights announced in Sunquist, what is the proper remedy? Quite obviously, it is a constitutional amendment. There is nothing radical or even unusual in proposing such an amendment. Indeed, the majority opinion in Sunquist, not the dissent, the majority said expressly limiting the substantive scope of the interest comprising the right to privacy is best left to constitutional amendment or interpretation of individual cases. In Tennessee, as in the rest of the country, political power is ultimately derived from the people. The very first eight words in your Constitution declare that all power is inherent in the people. If the people of a state should determine that their state constitution has been misinterpreted by their courts, or even if they simply disagree with a court interpretation of their state constitution, they are entitled to amend their constitution to reflect their will. In a democracy, the people, not the judges, have the final word. HJR 66, 88, and 127 would restore much needed balance to the Constitution of the State of Tennessee. It would allow the people acting through their duly elected representatives to enact reasonable abortion regulations, including informed consent and waiting periods that are fully consistent with the United States Supreme Court uh, interpretation of the federal Constitution. It would also protect from state constitutional challenge laws mandating parental consent and restricting public funding of abortion, except to the extent that those abortions are, have to be funded under current federal law, which is life, rape, and incest funding we're talking about there. Because HJR 66, 88, and 127 are substantially the same, I'll focus on 127 with the understanding that my comments also apply to the other two resolutions. The first sentence of HJR 127 provides Nothing in this Constitution secures or protects the right to abortion or requires the funding of an abortion. This sentence would overrule the decision in Sunquist and make the state constitution abortion neutral. That is, nothing in the state constitution would confer a right to abortion or require public funding of an abortion. It is important to note, it cannot be stressed too strongly, that abortion would remain a protected right under the federal constitution. Moreover, by virtue of the state's participation in the federal Medicaid program, under the current version of the Hyde Amendment, Tennessee would continue, and would have to continue, to pay for abortion in cases where the life of the mother was endangered and in cases when the pregnancy resulted from an act of rape or incest. That is, excuse me, that is required by your current state law. It's also required by a decision of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals involving a case from Michigan. The second sentence of HGR 127 provides, the people retain the right through their elected state representatives and state senators to enact, amend, or repeal statutes regarding abortion, including but not limited to circumstances of pregnancy resulting from rape or incest, or when necessary to save the life of the mother. This sentence is basically an amplification uh, or elaboration, if you will, of what is stated in the first sentence. It simply makes clear that it's for the people acting through their legislature to determine the manner and extent to which the practice of abortion shall be regulated in the state. And again, it cannot be emphasized too strongly, this authority could only be exercised consistently with federal constitutional limits. In other words, nothing in HJR 66, 127, or 88 would empower the state of Tennessee 
to prohibit or regulate abortion in violation of the federal constitution. Now I would like to turn to some of the objections that I have heard or have been raised to these three resolutions. One objection is that the amendment itself would outlaw abortions in Tennessee. That is clearly nonsense. Nothing in any one of these uh, resolutions would make abortion criminal in any circumstances. It simply restores the authority of the people acting through the legislature to legislate in this sensitive area. A related objection is that the amendment would empower the legislature to outlaw abortion. This objection is very misleading and under current federal constitutional doctrine, simply wrong. Under the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution, Tennessee, like all other states, is subject to the constraints imposed by the federal constitution. This is basic constitutional law. Any attempt to prohibit abortion, at least before viability, possibly even after, would run afoul of the Supreme Court's abortion jurisprudence. Nothing in these three resolutions would empower the legislature to enact laws that would violate the federal constitution. Even if Roe v. Wade, as modified by Planned Parenthood v. Casey, were overruled, nothing in any one of these three resolutions would require the state of Tennessee to adopt any regulations relating to abortion, much less any prohibition of abortion. The language of all three is very clear on this. And again, even assuming that Roe were overruled, which is simply not foreseeable uh, at the present time, abortion would remain legal for any reason before viability and for virtually any reason after viability in the absence of new legislation. Uh, let me digress for just a moment here and point out Tennessee, like most states, is a code state, which means conduct is not criminal unless it's specifically prohibited by statute. You do not have an abortion prohibition on your books. That was repealed after Roe was decided. If this amendment were adopted, or one of these amendments were adopted, and Roe were overruled the next day, abortion's legal, at least until viability, and very broadly after viability under the laws in effect now in Tennessee. Another objection that has been raised is that once the state Supreme Court has ruled on an issue of state constitutional law, the people should not attempt to overturn that ruling. I heard this objection when I was here seven years ago. This objection fundamentally misperceives the respective roles of the judiciary and the people in a democracy. The people have the last say, not the judges. Courts make mistakes, and when those mistakes involve a misreading of the Constitution, as the decision in Sunquist plainly does, in my judgment, they should be corrected by constitutional amendment. And there's nothing unusual about this. To take, one, but, to take but one example involving abortion, when the Florida Supreme Court struck down the state's law requiring parental notice, not consent, notice, on state constitutional grounds, the state legislature promptly responded with an amendment which, once approved by the people in a referendum, overturned that decision. Other states have adopted constitutions or constitutional amendments that have made their constitutions abortion neutral. The due process and equal protection guarantee of the Rhode Island Constitution says nothing in this section shall be construed to grant any right relating to abortion or the funding thereof. Very close to the first sentence of these three resolutions we're talking about. And finally, with respect to the issue of abortion funding, other states have gone even further than HJR 66, 88, or 127. They've amended their constitutions to prohibit public funding of abortion except to save the life of the mother. This would be Arkansas and Colorado. These resolutions merely permit the legislature to restrict public funding of abortion. It does not require the legislature to do so. Finally, there is nothing unique or uh, peculiar about a state constitution being amended to restrict or even eliminate a state constitutional right or to forestall a state court from recognizing such a right. In another area of the law, after the California Supreme Court decided last year that the California Constitution required recognition of same-sex marriages in a four to three decision, the people of the state of California approved a citizen-sponsored initiative, Proposition 8, which I'm sure you've all heard of, to overturn the results in that case. 
Although that initiative has been challenged, it is likely to be upheld, and the basis of the challenge would have no application in Tennessee because it involves the authority of a citizen initiative sponsored as opposed to a legislatively proposed uh, uh, resolution. Obviously, in, in Tennessee, this can only be done through the legislature. And in addition, besides California, more than half of the states, including Tennessee, have amended their constitutions to prevent their courts from recognizing uh, re requiring the states to recognize same-sex marriage. In a number of instances, including Alaska, Hawaii, and Oregon, this was done while appeals were pending in their state Supreme Court from lower court decisions saying, you have to recognize same-sex marriage. All three of those have been upheld. In sum, on these three resolutions, uh, one of these resolutions is necessary to restore the appropriate constitutional balance in Tennessee to give back to the people their rightful authority acting through their elected representatives and senators to determine the extent to which abortion shall be regulated in the state of, in the state of Tennessee, subject, of course, to federal constitutional limits. Now I would like to briefly address HJR 61. Uh, the language of this has already been quoted. I won't quote it again. It should be immediately apparent notwithstanding, uh, and with all due respect to Rep Representative Fincher's views, that this would enshrine abortion as an express right under the state constitution, something no other state has done, and to my knowledge, no other state has even contemplated doing. This resolution is objectionable on several grounds. First, there's no doubt at all that it would require public funding of abortion in circumstances not required by either the federal constitution or by the Hyde Amendment. When you look at the language, when it says, except in cases involving rape, incest, or health of the mother, the phrase that precedes that is, or requires the funding of an abortion. It's a basic principle of statutory and constitutional construction that if there's an or phrase, and there's a question as to whether what follows the or, or what precedes it, is modified by what happens, it's what, ha it's what comes afterwards, not what comes before it, if there's a doubt about it. In my opinion, there would be no doubt about this application in either situation. It would clearly require funding in those three cases. Second, it would codify the Supreme Court's decision, the Tennessee Supreme Court's decision in Sunquist, and permanently deny the General Assembly any flexibility in determining whether and under what circumstances abortions for rape, incest, and the health of the mother should be allowed in the event Roe v. Wade is overruled. Keep in mind, these exceptions are of academic interest at this point because so long as Roe is the law of the land, you can have an abortion for any reason, not just for rape or incest or life or some physical health reason, for any reason or no reason at all prior to viability and for virtually any reason thereafter. Even with respect to the mandated language exceptions for rape and incest, the language of HJR 61 does not by its terms allow the state to require that the act of rape or incest be reported to the proper authorities. As a consequence, HDR 61 very easily could be interpreted by your Supreme Court to prevent the state from discovering the perpetrator in circumstances when rape or incest has occurred and in detecting false claims of either. This came up in the Third Circuit with respect to the Medicaid funding restrictions. When the Hyde Amendment was amended in 1994 to add rape and incest exceptions, the state of Pennsylvania said, well, okay, we'll add those exceptions. We're part of the Medicaid system. We have to do that. But we're going to require that the act be reported to the proper authorities. The director of the relevant agency in HHS says, you can't do that if it's going to prevent anybody from having an abortion for those reasons. We're talking about indigent women now under the Medicaid program. And the Third Circuit said, that's right. You can't require that because the language does not authorize it, and this is a reasonable interpretation of the statute. The same thing could very easily happen here. You have no flexibility with respect to this if the court comes up with a definition or an interpretation you don't like. If they interpret a statute the way you don't like, you can change it. If they interpret the Constitution in a way you don't like, you've got to go through this whole process all over again. Third, by employing undefined terms, rape, incest, health of the mother, HDR 61 would confer on state courts, not this legislature, the power ultimately to determine what constitutes rape, incest, or health of the mother. 
Conferring such power on your state Supreme Court is particularly troublesome with respect to the concept of health. The Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, has given an extremely broad reading to the term health in the abortion context, contrary to what Representative Fincher said. In Doe v. Bolton, the companion case to Roe v. Wade in 1973, the court held that whether an abortion is necessary is a matter for the professional judgment of the physician that, quote, may be exercised in the light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age, relevant to the well-being of the patient. All these factors may relate to health. A constitutional amendment that would mandate an undefined health exception, keep in mind there is no definition of health in HJR 61, it just says health, would in all likelihood be interpreted by the state Supreme Court to allow abortions in virtually all circumstances, including an abortion sought for reasons of mental health. Mental health exceptions to abortion statutes, statutes were widely abused before Roe v. Wade was decided and most likely would be abused if Roe were overruled and the issue of abortion were returned to the states. In fact, in 1970, three years before Roe was decided, there were over 65,000 abortions performed in California under their Therapeutic Abortion Act. Over 98% of them were sought and approved for mental health reasons, even though this, they had a standard, they had a defined definition of mental health, which was basically the standard for civil commitment, and you still had over 60,000 abortions performed for those reasons. Clearly, it was being abused. Finally, let me conclude. In Planned Parenthood of Middle Tennessee versus Sunquist, the Tennessee Supreme Court wrongfully usurped the rightful authority of the people of this state, acting through their duly elected senators and representatives to adopt reasonable regulations of abortion consistent with the United States Constitution. That authority needs to be placed back in the hands of its rightful owners, the people. Either HJR 66 or 88 or 127 would do precisely that. This committee should act favorably on one of them, and for the reasons previously stated, it should reject HJR 61. I appreciate the committee's attention and be pleased to answer any questions the members may have, and uh, copies of my written testimony will be available uh, after I'm through testifying. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you have five additional members for the proponents uh, of these resolutions, but the floor is now open for questions.